Well, to discuss that story a bit further, I'm not joined from Washington by Mr. Webster Griffin Tarpley, who's an author and historian. Sir, thanks a lot for joining us. So firstly, I wanted to start off with your feelings on the prospects Thank of you. success for this ceasefire. Well, I think this, this ceasefire is simply impossible because uh, on the one hand, you have the Syrian government, and I think they could, they could observe a ceasefire if there were one. But on the rebel side, we've got upwards of 300 different death squads, 300 centers of initiative, 300 petty warlords. According to some accounts, they're grouped into three general groupings, but this is simply chaos. And uh, given the rivalries and even shootouts among these groups, if one group is observing the ceasefire, then certainly their rivals will want to show how radical they are by not observing the ceasefire. The other thing is that some of the larger uh, of these death squads would want to use this occasion to make uh, gains they otherwise couldn't, couldn't uh, get. Uh, here in Washington, the NATO propaganda line tonight is that the rebels have taken three neighborhoods in the city of Aleppo. I think we have to look at this with tremendous skepticism. But it does seem that they've been able to shoot a few artillery shells at Damascus, uh, again, taking advantage of the time right before the, the ceasefire. So there is no political will by the rebels to observe a ceasefire. And uh, the backers, right, the Saudis, the Bahrainis, the Qatar and the Emirates, uh, they don't want their puppets to, uh, to lie around and, uh, and relax. They want them to get out there and, uh, and destabilize the country. So, I think this is a dead letter from the word go. I want to pick up on your, on your mention of backers. Um, Russia has, of course, accused the United States of supplying arms to these insurgents. How do you assess that accusation and how, how valid it may be? Well, it's very good that General Makarov makes this point. When it comes from Moscow, it comes with a certain authority that, uh, that otherwise it wouldn't have. But, of course, we've been aware uh, for months that the U.S. has been uh, actively uh, shipping in weapons. They come in through the Incirlik NATO base in Turkey. We have U.S. Uh, CIA special forces and other officials on the ground near the border who act as traffic cops. They say it's to get it to the democratized uh, opposition forces. I don't think there are any of those. I think they give them to the most aggressive of the Al-Qaeda people who are, of course, operating in in Syria. So the U.S. is now arming al-Qaeda uh, in, in Syria, and uh, that, I think, is, is, is clear. So I welcome, we welcome the idea that the Russians have, have called international attention to it. Uh, maybe that should have consequences in the Security Council. Maybe there should be a resolution put in calling on the Western powers to stop fomenting civil war in Syria. All right, we'll have to leave it there for now, but we do appreciate your insight. That was Mr. Webster Griffin Tarpley, author and historian, speaking to us live from Washington. Hello everyone, welcome to GGN. Today is Monday, October 29th, 2012. I'm Darko. I'm going to just continue here. Um, we just covered this first video from Press TV. Syrian opposition will not observe the truths, says Webster Tarpley, and this is from October 26th. So October 26th. Two days later, October 28th, UN Arab League envoy says Syria truce not successful. So I guess he was right. The Algerian diplomat condemned bombings in Syria's civilian areas as terrorist acts. However, Syrian insurgents, insurgents set off a bomb in Damascus on the very first day of the holiday, sparking off fighting that went on unabated throughout the weekend. So they're not really covering this. It's all about the, the big hurricanes and the perfect storm that's coming. The Frankenstorm. It's funny that they call it Frankenstorm, too, because it's probably all the result of engineering, right? Uh, weather modification blowback. So... But you can see it there in the back behind Tarpley in D.C. Of course, it's a diversion against other things like the uh, atrocity in Libya, more evidence coming out of that. So it just keeps people kind of focused. Uh, they can't really think too much. Now they're thinking about the hurricane. So Turkish military pounds targets inside Syria. Turkish military has fired artillery shells in the neighboring Syria after a projectile slammed into Turkey's southern province. U.S. general says he's not sure who is firing Syrian shells into Turkey. NATO's and when we covered uh, the October 3rd shelling, which kicked off the whole um, uh, Turkey taking a defensive stance and authorizing military intervention inside Syria, it was found that it was actually the foreign-backed insurgents that were uh, firing uh, from Syria into Turkey. So it says uh, NATO's public lashing of Syria for shells not backed by any actual evidence. So despite NATO repeatedly and loudly condemning Syria for the shells straying into the Turkish border, 
or Turkish territory and threatening to defend Turkey from its smaller war-torn neighbor. There's no good evidence uh, who was shooting those shells in the first place. So this General Hurtling, uh, U.S. Lieutenant General, in an interview said that we are not sure if these shells are from the Syrian army, from rebels who want to get Turkey involved in the issue, or from the PKK. Any of those situations or options are possible as many of the rebels are openly backed by Turkey and would love nothing more to see than Turkey and by extension NATO invading to install them as a new regime. The PKK, the Kurdistan uh, Workers Party of course is eager to attack Turkey any chance they get and are increasingly involved in Syria's war. I remember the West uh, slamming Iraq about uh, it, you know basically grounding planes from Iran and inspecting them well they're finally doing it now. So it says Iraq officials says authorities searched Syria bound Iranian cargo plane and attacked Baghdad ensures it was not carrying any weapons. Our experts found that the plane was carrying only medical supplies and foodstuffs. So as much as uh, Iraq wants to um, try to assert its sovereignty, I guess, like I've been covering recently, they can't really much. They can't really do that that much like Pakistan because they're getting billions of dollars in aid for security. So and uh, once they uh, they stop taking orders from their puppet masters or their bosses, uh, well then all of a sudden Al-Qaeda will appear, more people will start getting blown up, and uh, drones will ensue, and there's a humanitarian crisis, right, and they'll get the regime change. Kurds, Iraqis, play a growing role in Syrian civil war. This is from antiwar.com. The PKK fighters are battling rebel free Syrian army around Aleppo, so another week of Syrian civil war means more new combats or combatants entering the regional conflict. The question of the Kurdish neutrality seems to be settled, at, at least so far as the PKK, the, Turk the Turkish-based Kurdish secessionist movement is concerned, with the group accusing the rebel Free Syrian Army of attacking Kurdish neighborhoods in Aleppo and retaliating against the Free Syrian Army bases. The fighting between the two has killed 36 in recent days, and 14 Kurds have been kidnapped by the Free Syrian Army in the process. Several Kurdish factions have set themselves up since the war broke out, and what happens with one is not necessarily an indication of where others will fall in with the war. That's kind of like what Tarpley was talking about inside Syria with the insurgent factions. The PKK shift is perhaps the most predictable as the Free Syrian Army is openly backed by the Turkish government. Some of the Kurdish groups are being trained in Iraqi Kurdistan. And they aren't only Iraqis getting involved in the war. Sunni Islamist factions have been flocking to Syria for months at the behest of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, AQI to fight against the Assad regime, and now Iraqi Shiites are also heading to Damascus, usually by the way of Iran or Lebanon first, and joining Shiite militias seeking to fight on behalf of the regime. So this uh, ties into this one article from October 16th that I covered, Turkey's southern buildup may aim at Kurds and not Syrian government. Forces may target PKK fighters across the border. It says several Kurdish factions are preparing for the possibility of war. With the PKK violence in southeastern Turkey on the rise, the Turkish government sees uh, more and more safe havens set up inside Syrian and Iraqi Kurdistan. Diplomats say that the deployment isn't nearly what it seems, and while some of the tanks may launch attacks across the border, talking about Syria and Assad, the target isn't the Assad government, but rather ethnic Kurds in the region. They see Turkey's endorsement of the Syrian rebellion as part of the Kurdistan strategy figuring that the Arab Sunni nationalist rebels would be more eager to tamp down Kurdish successionist ambitions than the Assad regime is. Then remember this, the uh, GCC, these are the ones that headed up the most recent um, escalation of um, uh, the foreign-backed insurgents in, uh, in Syria and stuff like that and getting the regime changed, the Gulf Cooperation. Um, it says here, Gulf Union plans emerge as Middle East braces to meet challenges. The main concern of the con conference, which included numbers of Bahraini and non-Bahraini thinkers, intellectuals, and politicians, was to identify the source of security threats against Bahrain in particular and the Gulf Arab states in general. They said that they were trying to address the Gulf's association with Arabism in light of the huge demographic imbalance that favors non-Arab nationalities. I don't know if they're just talking about uh, non-Sunnis and Iran's growing role in the Gulf region, i.e. Shiites. So one of their main focuses was the Arab Spring that is quote, supposedly st uh, taking place, the Western-induced Arab Spring to get uh, regime changes, and Bahrain, probably to make sure that it doesn't spread into Bahrain and uh, they don't get a regime change there because that's what they want right there. What, what they have in Bahrain is what they want. That's why nothing's changed here, even, even though people are protesting and why there's a media blackout there. Also, the other thing on the docket was establishing a Gulf Union. And this, of course, is what? 
This is uh, the purpose of creating this golf union as a way out of the crisis facing Bahrain and other Gulf Arab states, i.e. is they want to, these states like uh, Qatar and um, Saudi Arabia and them, they all want to push these, quote, uh, democratic transitions, you know, Arab Springs that are supposed to bring about democracy, and they themselves are uh, autocracies or um, dictatorships, theocracies, but they don't want that, that, that democracy and uh, Arab Spring coming to their country. Yeah, they said there's an imbalance of power within the so-called regional Gulf order. It included three regional Gulf powers, Iran, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia, and five smaller countries, which are Kuwait, UAE, Qatar, or Qatar, Bahrain, and um, the Sultanate of Oman. So the main countries they're concerned about is Iran and Iraq, like I said, Shiites. So it says here, regional instability could last a generation. The deputy foreign minister says he would not be surprised if the Arab Spring spawns eight new states in the near future. He says you have to remember that aside from Egypt, all the Arab countries are artificial. They were created by European gentlemen, um, British and French, who divided up areas of influence on the ruins of the Ottoman Empire. Says Elon also said that regional instability creates complications for investors who are interested in emerging markets, so it's always about business. However, he also put a positive spin on the situation, saying that the Sunni-Shia conflict and internal schisms within both, both branches of Islam are eroding the unity of the Arab League and reducing their... So we're talking about another 10 years of regional instability in the Arab world. Look at this, 10 more years of the drone war. So, yeah, it goes on here and says that uh, they're going to adding names to the kill or capture list uh, for drone strikes for the next 10 years as well. So the U.S. and the West are going to help with these uh, with uh, these Arab Spring and uh, Gulf Springs to ensure uh, security for global investment, right? That's what it's all about. U.S. military chief in Israel to oversee countries' largest ever joint maneuvers. The American military chief was in Israel to observe the largest armed forces drill between the two countries. Also, we have Navy replaces Admiral leading Middy's strike group because of ongoing investigation. The Navy's replaced the Admiral commanding an aircraft carrier strike group while it's deployed to the Middle East. Pretty interesting. It said uh, investigation of allegations of inappropriate leadership judgment. It makes you wonder if he was actually not really for this strike. I think uh, Secretary Gates, he kind of just disappeared, didn't he? I think he was uh, not for the Israeli strike as well says here, U.S. Navy test armed drone boat. The killer robots have officially gone out to sea. For the first time, the Navy has fired missiles from a remote-controlled boat, as shown in the video above. Great Britain said to refuse use of bases for U.S. attack on Iran. If the United States decides to attack Iran over its nuclear program, it will do so without the help of Great Britain. It's interesting, though, because I think Saudi Arabia actually said the same thing. And I think they got uh, basically a cyber attack or something from most likely Israel. Iran group of naval fleets docks at Sudan port. In line with the Islamic Republic's strategy of expanding its naval presence in international waters, the Navy's second, 22nd fleet of warships has called to the northeastern port of the Red Sea. So commenters are saying this great news, good news. I hope Iran helps the Sudanese protect themselves from the scumbag of the universe that is the Israeli government. We have Saudi Arabia funding Mossad anti-Iran operations. An article posted by a former CBS editor claims that none other than Saudi Arabia helps fund Israeli Mossad operations against Iran. I'm talking about the cyber attacks, assassinations, uh, and stuff like that. U.S. denies involvement in the Sudanese attack. I'm not sure if you could believe them even if they told you this, but the CIA says it was not involved in the Israeli attack on the weapons factory in Sudan's capital. Sudan. This is from Reuters saying a front for Israel's proxy war on Sinai jihadists. I'm surprised to see this title from, um, from Reuters. Israel declines to confirm or deny attacks in Sudan, and the defense officials uh, says that uh, the Khartoum aids Gaza arms smuggling, so that's why they did it, I guess. Some commenters see factory blasts as a warning to Iran, so that's why Iran sent the ships, probably. And in Mali, the focus on French military engagement and recolonization. So Resolution 2071, adopted by the Security Council of the UN, is not a green light for a military intervention. And why? Well, because Algeria is supposedly the green light. France, the U.S. pushed Algeria to back military intervention in Mali. The intervention in northern Mali is possible without the military backing of Algeria, but not without its green light. So I covered this before. This is about large gold reserves and not so much terrorists. And if Algeria endorses the attack against Mali, they will definitely be next. This is GGN and I'm Darko. Thank you.